It is a great day to be a Christian. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Some folks are afraid of the end of the world. And some people are looking forward to it. Some people just don't believe it's going to happen. The question is, why is it that some Christians feel the same way? They're fearful for the Lord's return. And how should we think about Jesus coming back? So let's look at Matthew chapter 24. Begin reading in verse 36. Matthew writes, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour <clears throat> as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. <clears throat> Excuse me. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he's not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him as portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There are days that can be scary. A Friday night, if you were outside, or even if you were inside close to a window, you could feel the wind, you could hear the the noise as things were blowing, uh, the darkness, the clouds that were coming in, it was scary. Uh, it must have been something like that in 1780, but it was in the middle of the day. 1780, uh, the Connecticut House of Representatives was meeting, and all of a sudden, in the middle of the day, it got dark. In fact, it got so dark that they couldn't see. Uh, they didn't know what was going on. The clouds in the sky were just really ominous and they decided that the end of the world was coming and so somebody said let's adjourn we need to go home it's the end of the world and a man named colonel davenport stood up and he said this the day of judgment is either approaching or it is not if it's not there's no cause for adjournment if it is i choose to be found doing my duty therefore i wish that candles be brought the world's going to end, it's going to end. Nothing we can do about it. Going home's not going to matter. If the world is not going to end, I want to be doing what I'm supposed to be doing. That needs to be our attitude. When the world ends, we need to be doing what we're supposed to be doing. There's still people that react that way. They're scared. They're afraid. They're worried about the second coming of the Lord. I confess to begin with, I never saw an episode of this, but I read about a a series that was on NBC TV several years ago, uh, back about 2005. It was called uh, Revelations. And in this series called Revelations, it was a religious-based series. There was this nun named Sister Joe, And Sister Joe was investigating these strange phenomenon that she thought pointed towards the end time. Uh, the producer of the show uh, was interviewed by TV Guide, and he said this, so many people believe we have to save our souls right now. Sister Job believes in Revelation, but she refuses not to have hope. She feels that humankind can come together and forestall the end of days. Okay, she wanted to forestall the end of days. She wanted to stop Jesus from coming. Uh, I'm not sure it works that way. I'm not sure there's anything we can do to keep Jesus from coming back. In fact, I don't think we can even do anything 
to slow him down. But the question is, why would, would somebody who claims to be a Christian want to do that? Why would they want to prevent Jesus from coming back? That's supposed to be our goal. That's why we're supposed to be living our lives anticipating that day when Jesus returned. But I think that the people that produced that show weren't doing it from a Christian perspective. You may not realize this, but the people at NBC TV are not a Christian organization. Uh, in fact, they probably feel if the world is going to end, if there is going to be judgment, if Jesus is coming back, if there is going to be a, a revelation that they're not going to be ready, so maybe they projected their fear of the second coming over onto the character in their story. There are others who are not afraid. They just don't believe it. They don't think it's going to happen. They don't think Jesus is coming. And Jesus kind of predicted that in Luke 18, 8. He said, nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? In other words, when I come back, is anybody going to be there waiting for me? Is there anybody going to believe that I'm coming back? Will there be people waiting for Jesus to return? And if you look at some statistics, you'll wonder if there will be. Uh, back several years ago, there was a survey of people that had graduated from seminaries, from theological seminaries, people that were supposed to be training to be preachers in different churches. And the question was asked, do you think Jesus is coming again? 3% of people that graduated from this seminary believed that Jesus was coming back. 3%. And so you wonder, what were they teaching at this seminary uh, if they didn't think Christ was coming back? Uh, John MacArthur did a survey of Protestant ministers and found that 90% of them had no expectation of Christ returning to earth. They didn't think he was coming again. Uh, they were kind of like the little four-year-old boy. He said, Mommy, uh, when do I get to go to heaven? And she said, well, son, either when you die or when Jesus comes back. And the little boy said, he's coming back? You mean he's been here already? These people that are supposed to be preachers, they're supposed to be studying in the seminary. They didn't believe he's coming back. Obviously, they didn't really pay attention when he came the first time. They hadn't listened to any of his teachings. They didn't know what he was saying when he was on earth. So they weren't any better off than this little four-year-old boy. They don't get it. They don't understand. They reject the second coming of Jesus. But if you read the Bible, he's coming back. The song said he's coming back. He said he would. And we know that that's the truth. Jesus is coming back. But Peter told us not everybody's going to believe it. Look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 3, Peter says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. In other words, they're saying the sun came up this morning, sun went down tonight, everything's just like it's always been. Why do we think anything's ever going to be any difference? Nothing ever changes why should we expect Jesus to come back? We'll skip down a few verses. Uh, down in verse 10, Peter said, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Peter's telling us that the reason some people reject the second coming is they don't pay any attention to what's going on around them. They think that things are going to just keep on going the way they've always gone. They are kind of like people eating off a buffet. Take a little bit of this and a little bit of that. They like the Jesus that's born in the manger. They like the Jesus that talks about God being love. They talk about love your brothers and sisters. They like that part, but they don't like that part about where he comes back and where he stands in judgment over the world. Matthew chapter 24 Jesus tells what happens to people that don't accept his word. Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 48, it says, But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, 
and in an hour that he's not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew says that the people that are not ready for Christ will be considered wicked servants. But what is it about a servant that makes him wicked? What are the characteristics of a wicked servant? Well, first of all, he's convinced that the Lord's not coming back. Uh, he says to himself, my Lord delayeth his coming. And because he doesn't think the Lord's coming back, uh, he begins to live selfishly. Says that he mistreats his other servants. He starts eating and drinking with the drunkards, with the worldly people. Jesus says, because that servant thinks the master is delayed, he doesn't have to worry about how he lives his life. His bad theology leads him to hanging out with bad companions and engaging in bad behavior because he's not expecting the Lord to come back. I read about a young man that was baptized. He'd attended worship at this place for a long, long time before he ever obeyed the gospel. And when he finally obeyed the gospel, the preacher asked him, what took you so long? You've been coming here for years. What made you change your mind? And he said, well, I finally decided to believe what you were saying. He said, before, I'd come to church and I'd see these same people at school. I'd see these same people at work and they were cussing and they were telling dirty jokes and they didn't seem to believe what you were saying. So I didn't think that I needed to believe it either. Didn't seem to matter to them. So why should it matter to me? People like that are disinterested in being in part of a, a social organization they haven't bought into the doctrine of Christ. They don't believe what's being said. But if you don't believe Jesus is coming back, then you don't have to change the way you live. It's okay to do whatever you want to because it's not going to matter. You're not ever going to have to face judgment. Back in 1999, there were some employees of the Boeing Aircraft Corporation that decided they would like to get one of those life rafts out of a 747 that they thought it'd be fun to go down the river in. And they managed to steal a life raft out of a 747. Got it off the grounds of the factory. Got it to one of their houses. Everything was going well and it was time for their river trip. They all got in the raft. They started down the river there having a great time until this Coast Guard helicopter flew in and started following them down the river. What they didn't realize is there's a homing device inside those life rafts. When you blow it up, it sends a radio beacon out so that they can send rescue craft to come and find you. Uh, they didn't understand that. They didn't think anybody would ever find out. They didn't think anybody would notice, but they did. Those people don't work for the Boeing Aircraft Company anymore. People were going to stand in judgment. God is looking. Jesus is coming back, and we need to be ready. Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. The Lord's coming back. The world's going to be destroyed. Look at verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? God's going to send Jesus back. He's going to stand in judgment. Since that's going to happen, how should we act? What should we do? What kind of people should we be? How we believe determines how we live. If we think Jesus is coming back, then we'll live to be prepared when he comes back. If you think judgment is imminent, you're going to live a more holy life. That's what Jesus said in our original passage in Matthew 24. But the day and the hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven. Look at uh, Matthew 24, verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So also, or so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Did Noah believe the flood was coming? Did he act accordingly? Noah thought the rains could come at any moment, so he wanted to make sure that he did what God told him to do. He spent every waking moment building the ark and preaching to anybody that would listen and trying to make sure that his family was safe inside the ark. How about the other people around Noah? Did they believe that the floods were coming? 
No, and they acted accordingly. Since they didn't believe what Noah was saying, they didn't pay any attention to his preaching. They went ahead and mocked and made fun of him. And when judgment came, when the waters came down, they all perished. They lost their lives and everything they had. But not Noah, because he believed in God. He was safe inside the ark. He believed God's promise, and he lived his life accordingly. He's like the good servant in Matthew chapter 24, verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. The faithful servant is one that took the master seriously. When the master told him what to do, he did it and he was prepared. People like that will talk to anybody that will listen about Jesus. They'll do everything they can to make sure that their family is safe. Uh, but we need to realize that Noah didn't build the ark because he was afraid. God didn't say, if you don't do this, I'm going to wash you away. God promised Noah that if he did what he told him to, that he'd be spared. Noah believed in that and he acted in faith. Noah was driven by a promise. And we have that same promise of salvation. Because Noah believed God's promise, he did what God ask him to do, he was saved from the floods. And that's what Peter tells us can happen to us in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 18, Peter says this, For Christ also hath once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a-preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure wherein too even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject to God. To him. Noah was saved because he did what God asked him to do. He built an ark. But did God need a boat to save Noah? Couldn't God have just picked Noah up out of the off the ground and put him up in the clouds till after the flood was over? Couldn't he just set him on top of the highest mountain and let the floods come everywhere else besides there? God didn't need a boat to save Noah. The boat didn't save Noah. God saved Noah. It says that God closed the door and watched over them. But because Noah did what God asked him to do, he and his family were saved. Now Peter tells us, God's not asking us to build a boat. That's not how we get to safety, but he is telling us what he wants us to do. Uh, again, Noah wasn't motivated by fear. We don't need to be motivated by fear. We need to be motivated by God's promise. He's promised us, if we'll do what he asks to do, if we'll live the way he asks us to live, that he'll save us. He'll give us a home. Our salvation is not through a boat, but through baptism. But does that water save us? The water doesn't save us any more than the boat saved Noah. It's obeying God that saves us. It's submitting our will to his will that brings us to salvation. That's why that should be our attitude when we think about the second coming of Jesus. We should be anxiously anticipating his arrival. We should think about it the way we sing about it. Uh, some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. We're going to go to be with Jesus. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. And when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. That should be our mindset. That should be the way we think about heaven. Those songs are driven by the promise of an expectation of eternity with Christ. But to have that promise, you need to be a Christian. It's the only life worth living, the only death one would dare to die. You are a Christian. Have you forgotten that the Lord's coming back? Are we living lives that make other people think that we really don't believe what we're claiming to believe, that we're not living lives of expectation? Are we afraid of the second coming? Or do we really believe he's coming? If we do, are we living that way? If you need to make a change tonight, you do it right now. As we stand together, as we sing.